It is my pleasure to introduce to you this morning Kimball Talley. Kimball is a training specialist at Mather Training Center in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. She has worked for the Interpretive Development Program, which I will refer to as IDP going forth, since June 2012. Kimball received a bachelor's degree in history from the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. She also has a master's in secondary education and a master's in learning systems technology. As a lead instructor and facilitator for the IDP's popular course on facilitated dialogues, Kimball travels all over the country working with the National Park Service staff and partners sharing how best to offer opportunities for the public to engage in meaningful conversations on topics that are controversial. We have a bit of a controversial topic ourselves with agriculture. Kimball began experimenting with the power of dialogue after attending a summer residential program at Mount Vernon in Virginia and it was focused on life, leadership, and legacy. A few years later, after joining the National Park Service, she attended a training facilitated by the International Coalition of Sites of Conscious that used many of the same principles. As a trainer with the IDP, Kimball gets to use parks as her laboratory. How fun is that? She lives in Hagerstown, Maryland with her husband, Daryl, and a five-year-old daughter, Courtney, and three-year-old son, Kenneth, and her 20-year-old son lives in Little Rock, Arkansas. It is my pleasure to introduce Kimball to come and share her experience and expertise with us this morning. Kimball? So, hey, hello. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. In Iowa for the very first time. It's always a joy to be invited to speak on something I'm very passionate about giving up authority, letting go, inviting visitors to share their personal experience. Over the hour, I would like to invite you to not only be open to the idea, but to be an active participant. I share a little bit about myself. I describe why dialogue, the parts of dialogue, its benefits, and then let you ask questions. So I have one guideline to be open. So if I can get a thumbs up. So you may be asking yourself, what is facilitated dialogue? So we're going to start with, what is dialogue? So dialogue is the exchange of ideas, opinions, beliefs, and feelings, listening with respect and being able to express one's own views with confidence. So what is facilitated dialogue? I'll let you read that. So facilitated dialogue is a strategy. It's a strategy that you plan for using what we call arc of dialogue that we'll talk about in just a little bit. So it's a structured, meaningful, audience-centered conversation about a topic. For the most part, what I do is the topic is probably controversial or challenging, but it doesn't have to be. We're going to practice with that over the next hour. So audience-centered interpretation. So I want you to get a sticky note. You have sticky notes at your table. Create a T-chart, and I want you to put now and in the future. So one side is now, the other side is in the future. Who is your audience? Who is your visitor? Who do you engage? So think about those three things. One side to the left is now, the other side is in the future. I like to begin with sharing a little bit about myself. And I'd like to remind you that I'll be doing two sessions later for those interested in learning more about facilitated dialogue. This is just like, kind of like an introduction to it. So identity. Who am I? Who are you? As an individual, as a person part of a family, a person part of a culture, maybe even a person part, part, part of a bi-culture, this all shapes dialogue and facilitation skills. Which We'll talk about that later. Your ability to relate to others, to have empathy, to treat all opinions fairly, being self-aware is all essential. 
the awkwardness of members of the Sons of Confederacy walking out a presentation I did on the Civil War and slavery, school kids asking to touch my skin in North Arkansas, or even today when people, both black and white, ask to touch my hair. <laughs> this is who I am. So a little bit about my background. I was born in 1976 to a single parent. And actually, that's a picture of my mom there in the left hand she, with the wedding dress. She actually honestly had an affair with my father, was divorced, and had me. She was carrying twins, and my twin brother Courtney died shortly after birth. She didn't take it so well, and um, sometime I was given to my grandparent, Lucille, who was actually in the green dress. I lived in a tough neighborhood. I was teased and bullied by my peers for being light-skinned and having long hair, which I do not have long hair. <laughs> I went to an all-black elementary school. I had all-black teachers. In fifth grade, I joined um, and played softball on a mostly all-white team. I had a coach, coaches called Mike and Mike. And for the first time, I actually had father figures. These two men uh, came to my neighborhood. The only time you saw white men in my neighborhood is if they were selling drugs or the police. And they risked all that to drop me off when I didn't have a ride. Most of my real experiences with whites were through sports and extracurricular activities. For example, in high school, I participated in debate. I debated four years in high school. Um, I probably saw maybe three other people of color in my class. It was even less um, noticeable when I went out to debate, to, to debate other teams. So I participated in a program called Minority to Majority, um, where minority students can go to a majority school. Um, and actually, I shouldn't say minority students. Minority could be, you could be white. But in this case, I was African American going to a predominantly all white school. Most of my core classes were with white students. This began my many experiences of being the only one in the room. In college, I became the second African-American female to be student government president and later received a graduate assistantship to run a program called Teaching Enhancements Affecting Minority Students. The purpose of this program was to help minorities, international students, and first-generation students feel connected and a part of their college experience through activities. So I received a sizable budget just to plan activities to get students out in the community um, and also to pr present them with educational opportunities. The many experiences I had in college helped shape me become the teacher I would become from traveling around the country presenting research, speaking in front of groups as the SGA president in college, being a mentor for minority students, and the real relations I developed with my white professors. I taught social studies at an all-boys public school for four years and taught remediation um, during the summer. And it was one year with the all-girls middle school. I developed action research, experimented with emerging trends like student-led conferences, and facilitated dialogue. <laughs> one fall, I learned about a summer program that invited teachers to two weeks to Mount Vernon for the George Washington Institute, I was introduced to the Socratic Seminar. We were presented a document, an image, a quote, and a series of open-ended questions. And this transformed me. Working with the all boys was the toughest job I had ever done. I've been to police academy, I've had three babies, two knee surgeries, and a divorce. But nothing had ever been more difficult than teaching eighth grade boys. But now I had a tool, and that tool was facilitated dialogue. I used this technique about once a month, and I noticed the difference. I would present um, the role of women, um, the future of rights of women. When I taught, um, I'm trying to think what session that was, it was a few years ago. Um, I presented um, pictures and primary search document information when I taught the Industrial Revolution. So the kids had a chance to actually um, reflect on the conditions of young people and how those students didn't have a chance to go to school. They had to go to work. 
The dialogues were addicting as they wanted to share their opinions and how they see the world based on their experience. After leaving the classroom and joining the park service as an education specialist at Little Rock Central High School National Historic Site, I also implemented the Socratic Seminar into programs and teacher professional development. I was selected to participate in a pilot course called Interpreting Critical Issues Using Civic Engagement and Facilitated Dialogue as a Technique. This course was enlightening and it gave me more structure. So let's talk about that. I've led more than 100 dialogues. The people, the experiences, their passion, the differences, the agreements, all are part of me. With traditional interpretation, I could always tell you what I say it, but with facilitated dialogue, I can tell you what others say. So now let's learn a little bit about you. Identity, who are you? At your table, pair up and share who you are with your partner. You have uh, two minutes. <laughs> so now, at your table, you're gonna pair up with someone else. So let's mix things up. And one thing I love about dialogue, sometimes people can't quit talking, right? So at your table, pair up with someone else and share how your identity shapes others. So how does my identity shape others? So the National Park Service, uh, when I joined the Park Service and almost eight years ago, it was 78% white. And in 2015, it is now 82% white. And so when I go to many trainings and we talk about civic engagement, I tend to bring up who I am and how people like me, who look like me, don't go to national parks. And so it's just funny sometimes, um, we did a host of trainings over maybe two years, and not one single person that went to a training was black. And we have the evidence that we have a training center because we take class photos. And I said, this is not acceptable. And so we just had a, a course this past fall, and we had Asians and Hispanics and black folks. We had folks that represent LGBT. And to me, that's the park service I want to be a part of. And we have to be ourselves and to not be, have the, the, the courage to talk about those things. So we're going to talk about those things for a little bit. So why dialogue? So I don't want to present a whole lot of research. Um, I have two things I want to share. And the first thing is the National Park Second Century Commission, they revisited Leopold. Um, some research that was done over 50 years ago that looked at resource management in the park service. You can see the three goals. We'll just take a, a glimpse at goal number one. The three goals stay the same from the first report to the most recent report. And it's what should be the goals of resource management in the National Park Service. So to provide transformative experiences. That's what I got out of that goal. Now, I want to say facilitate dialogue alone does not mean you're going to have a transformative experience. But what I do believe in menus of option or like levels of engagement. So at Vicksburg National Military Park, where I'm acting chief of interpretation, it's not just about getting the same visitors. And I want to tell you, um, you know, all the, the stuff that's sold in the gift shop, a certain percentage of that comes to the parks. When I got to Vicksburg, we had 100 and, um, over $130,000 in Eastern National account. And the superintendent said, Kimball spent 30,000. Anybody knows me, I like to spend money. <laughs> and so we spent $30,000. And then I received the balance January um, and we had $132,000 in that account still. So it's visitation, people are coming to the park and they're visiting the park and they're spending their money, but who are those visitors? And who can we tap into? And so, and are those visitors getting a different experience? So if you have someone who's from the neighborhood who brings their family friends in, you know, what experience do they get? You know, how do we energize that person to make sure that they're park stewards? And so this report acknowledges that we need to expand the relevance and benefits of parks to underrepresented minority groups and communities. 
Vicksburg National Military Park um, sits in a community of 67% African American, and I haven't seen one black person in that park outside of walking in the park before or after we're there. That's not acceptable. The second piece of research I want to present is on museums and libraries. Raise your hand if you work in a museum or library. All right, so hopefully you've seen this document. And it talks about the difference between 20th century interpretation versus 21st century. So we'll do a poll in just a minute to see who are our 21st century museums. But let's look at some of the things. And I want you to look at some of the languages like co-creation, audience-centered, 21st century skills like critical thinking, listening, and speaking. So looking at the orange side of the chart, where are you if you're a museum? Raise your hand again if you're doing 21st century interpretation. Raise your hand. It's hard to read. We got some people that's close. Read some of those words out. But again, I mentioned some of those things. How are you, co how are you sharing authority? So why dialogue again? It's opportunities to engage in courageous conversations. And this does not have to be face-to-face. -face. This can be virtual, can be through social media, can be just asking an open-ended question at the start of your presentation or your program. It's a physical and intellectual challenge. Sometimes it's, it's physical. I've, been, I've done programs and I say, hey, we're gonna, this is different. This is an audience-centered program, not a ranger-led program. And I know I have people who wanna walk out the room. They're not extroverts like me. Now, I haven't had anybody to leave, but I've had people to tell me at the, at the end of a program that they wanted to leave, but they're glad they stayed. So it takes a physical challenge for some people. Also intellectual, you're gonna push people to think and to listen to other people who don't necessarily agree with them. It's a place for healing and hope, right? I worked at a civil rights park, all right? That's the healing. We all work in places where it gives us hope to hear young people and other people who don't necessarily agree to say, you know what, I changed my mind and getting the public to appreciate the real. A lot of times, you know, young people take these virtual experiences, they're online, but our places are the real. So earlier I heard Billy and Chrissy, is that right, in the back, um, who work together, right? And um, I just heard a conversation, I won't talk about what I heard. <laughs> But Jahari's Window is a really good activity for teens, for people who work together. I think it's important, you're, when you become a great facilitator, you look at these dynamics that, happen, that are happening right in front of you, but doing activities where you can explore the concepts of Jahari's Window. So who's familiar with this concept? Who's looked at this? All right, you have to Google it later. But basically, the more you share, the more you're open, the more you ask questions, the more you observe, the more you're self-aware, the more you open this window and you become open and not hidden. You become open and not blind. Now some things need to stay hidden, right? You're not gonna share everything when you meet people. I right? tell young people all the time, you know, what happens in this room may leave this room. So know what you're sharing because your friends may use it against you. I mean, that's just being honest. So some things may need to stay hidden, but some things, some things we do on our teams, I work on, with a team of four people, and some things I think we can share to become more aware. And so I remember a conversation heading from New York, we went to the Tenement Museum to actually check out their facilitated dialogue. And um, one of my coworkers said, oh, Kimball, you just, you make me fearful sometimes. I'm like, girl, I'm black. This is how I talk. When I get upset, my, my emotions, I'm elevated. This does not necessarily mean just because I'm black, but it's part of my culture. And this, it was offensive for her to say that she was afraid of me, because I'm not gonna do anything to you. I love my job. <laughs> but we need to understand our relationships with people. I had a lady in the park come up to me. As soon as she came in and she saw my fro, she was like, you know, game on, rolling her sleeves up. I could tell. I was reading her nonverbals. She said, why are all the schools in Texas being changed from the Confederate names to whatever? And, you know, she was just really upset about stuff that's happening in society. And I said, tell me more. I said, what are you doing about it? How are you being active? So when you start using these skills of facilitated dialogue, I can take an angry person and make them gentle. And she really couldn't tell me what she's doing. I'm like, well, go to social media. You know, if they have a forum, you have a forum. 
You know, you have, we have to be active participants in our community. And so she ran off to go learn more about um, Grant and uh, Pemberton. The next thing I want to talk about real quick is four truths. This is from the, African, the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, on their work on apartheid. And people come into our spaces with truths, right? So it's the personal truth, forensic truth, societal truth, reconciliatory truth. And I'm going to explain it using slavery because that's my area of expertise. So some people have different personal truths. My personal truth is slavery happened, that West Africans were brought over to the United States and were enslaved, chattel property. I go to a teacher workshop and a lady tells me white folks was also enslaved. I'm like, girl, here in the United States? She's like, yeah. I said, you mean indentured servitude? She said, no. That's her personal truth. I can't change her mind just by giving her information, Googling it, like, can you see this? That was her personal truth. People come into our places with their own truths and we have to recognize it and appreciate it. Forensic truth, we have the evidence that says West Africans came over. We have um, the objects, the artifacts. We have the documents. We have the diaries. We have the census data. All these things that tell us that slavery happened. We have societal truth. We teach it, hopefully. I've met teachers who say they don't teach slavery because they feel uncomfortable. So we have the societal truth, a paragraph that's in an American history book. And hopefully our bright teachers who are going to explore and go more in depth. And then the reconciliatory truth is um, Black History Month. Is when we recognize, when we appreciate, when we say, I hear you, I see you. So what is your truth around climate change, civil rights, civil war, immigration, biodiversity loss, land use, groundwater, farming, agriculture, overdevelopment, whatever it is, what is your truth? What is your audience? What is their truth? So let's talk about facilitated dialogue. There are several parts. Ground rules, arc of dialogue, shared experience, techniques, open-ended questions, and facilitation skill. And I will say it takes time. I, use, um, I tell people to change behavior it takes four variables. Self-efficacy, right, the belief that if I fail, it's okay. If a person walks, I was on a program at, um, at the, the USS Carroll at Vicksburg, and I asked the question of what, is, what have you lost? And I was really meaning I should have did a better job Maybe like telling them, you know, if you lost a charm necklace or something. And it went real deep, real fast, and half my audience walked away. But it's okay, because I know that maybe my phase two question was too deep. I took people places they, want, they didn't want to go too fast. Uh, another variable, of course, is the skill itself, being trained as, um, in facilitated dialogue. Also is practice. You actually have to actually practice what you learn. Then the last variable is support. How are you supporting your teammates? How is your manager supporting their staff in doing this? So let's look at things. And we already talked about ground rules. Your ground rule today was to be open. And I can share this PowerPoint for those who want it. And, and so some of the things says use I statements, suspend judgment. So there's all kinds of rules that you can do. And you can do ground rules, guidelines. Uh, when I'm working with young people, I like to say guidelines. When they hear the word ground rules, they kind of like, you know, shut down. Because they hear rules. They don't want to come to my park and follow any rules. And then there's this arc of dialogue. So there's four, four phases. Phase one, building community. Every person in the room has a voice. So earlier, your phase one question was, who are you? Something safe, something simple. When I do programs around the Little Rock Nine, raise your hand if you heard of the Little Rock Nine, Central High Crisis in 1957, where nine African American students go to an all white school of 2000. So I might ask a question like, share your name and an extracurricular activity you did in high school. And of course, everybody's like, what does she want to know about what I did in high school? But later, I'm going to introduce the Little Rock Nine. I'm going to say, these students, played in band and were in choir and ran track and they had to give all that up to go to the integrated school. You just go to school, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter the things that you were doing. And it's a real connection to people because then they start to look at, man, I was in gymnastics or I played karate or whatever the case may be, could I give that up to go to a school? That's phase one. Phase two, personal experience. Now we'll say this phase one, you want to get all voices in the room, you want all voices to be heard. Sometimes there's a large group, you might have to do things at a table. So you may not get to hear every single voice. 
But as the facilitator, you're walking around, you're listening to those things. Phase two, personal experience. Each of us have our own personal experiences. You know, I'm up here today so I get a chance to talk about myself. All right, and it's great when people can be listened to, can be heard. And you also get to learn about your visitor because you're listening to the visitor. Phase three is beyond the personal. So it's okay to be heard, right? But then we have to do something about it. How do the, you know, how do the people who come into your space, how are they connected to the greater society? How are with the, the work that we're doing in our local communities, in our spaces, how are they connected to our greater society? So you can't just leave it with the personal. You have to ask a question like, uh, I was in Selma for the 50th anniversary. I was asked to do these dialogues, 10, 10 a day. And one of the questions we asked about voting was, how do people entertain their right to vote? And we'll talk more about the open-ended questions, but it's about giving, you know, it's about asking a question where people can say, well, people don't vote. The folks in my community are not voting. Or you can say, hey, people are voting. And then phase four is, this, is the meaning making. All right, so we had this great discussion now what, for me, is the action. What can we do to make our world better? What can we do to make folks appreciate farming and agriculture? Then we have a shared experience. And I forgot to turn my hotspot on. We can turn that on. I grew up playing football, basketball, baseball, right in this park. I live pretty close here, about 12 blocks away, and this is the park that I come to. The last time I heard about healthy eating, elementary. I was eating healthy for a minute, uh, salads, uh, light snacks like carrots and yogurt. I like to eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. If I can only eat one fruit for the rest of my life, I'll be amazing. Um, I eat watermelon. Celery is my thing. Like, I love celery with passion. My mom made this white meat chili once, and it was just ridiculously good. And after you, elementary is like nutrition went out the window. When I have like hours of play, then I'm just with thirsty and hungry. So I take about six burgers. You want to eat like any salad? They usually cost around eight bucks. Why is it a burger cheaper than the lettuce? Right? It's cheaper if you want to go to a fast food place and just go and get like a uh, meal there and chef at home and cook it. I can't afford it. You know, like, yeah, it's better than, yeah, it's uh, on the more expensive. I used to grab like two or three bags of groceries and I had my backpack from work and I had my headphones and I had my laptop. I'm like, I don't see how people do it. Like, you're a pony or something. I've done that once, dude, and I had a ranch in this car too, man. It was like swinging, people were looking, I was like, hey, how you doing? Like, I'm getting all the groceries on. I don't do that every day, you know, that'd be just like ridiculous. I've never grocery shopping in our neighborhood. That's that's crazy. Well, if you go to the grocery store around here, you're gonna end up finding the same thing that you find in any other grocery store. Is, but it's probably gonna be going to quality. The lettuce look picked over. The tomatoes look smashed and mushy. The fruit look like bugs and ate on it. Everything's like, oh, um, like you don't want to eat it. It's like living in a desert. I'm a hobby desert. No fresh food. <laughs> Alrighty, so at your table, on a sticky note, one word check in. So write down one word, one reaction from the video. I'm gonna give you about three minutes at your table to talk about your one word, your one word reaction. So about three minutes. But this shared experience should be something that each person can share together, they have the same information. It can be your exhibit space, it can be um, a, a quote, it can be an image, it can be a chapter in a book, it's a lot. It can be an excerpt, it can be an article, it can be a sung lyric, it can be music. All right, so a shared experience is something that each, that each person, when, you, when they come to the, the place, that they do together. So I'm gonna go back real quick to the arc. So for me, my shared experience, for the most part, is after phase one. So I wanna spend time to build community, and then we do that thing together. So it could be, um, you know, kids come to the park, they introduce themselves, and then I say, okay, go walk the exhibits in silence, and maybe back here in 20 minutes. And that's their time. And you wanna always give instructions. It doesn't matter that they do it in silence, 
but if it does, you want to make sure. And again, that's the facilitation skills. And they come back in 20 minutes, and you say, okay, let's have, let's have a conversation. Techniques. And I'm sorry this room is so small, or I'm sorry, it's large, and I only have 15 minutes left. But I have pictures over here to the, on the floor. And for you all on this side, you have to come and look at them later. But that technique, and so there's just photos over there, and it's, it's a technique called photo language. So you ask a question. So if we had time, I was going to ask you the question, what's the future of the forum story? What's the future of the forum story? And you tell people, hey, I want you to walk around. We're going to do a gallery walk. The first time you walk around, find your photo, but don't pick it up. So you've, everybody, so it would take a lot of time to have everybody go by and look at those photos. They go by, look at the photos. You remind them, please don't pick your photo up. You're going to go by, and once everybody has went through the gallery walk, you start over, now grab your photo. And it's okay if you share the same photo, because when you get your photo, you're going you're gonna to pick it up and show your photo. And so if you have, say, five people that goes to one photo, that's fine. If you have only one person that goes to an individual photo, you just put them with another group. And you ask them to, you know, why did they go to that photo? What resonated with you? What surprised you? What do you want to learn more about? What do you want to talk more about? And so um, it's a really cool photo, for, especially for visual learners um, that may need time to process. And, you know, a large group discussion may be a lot for them. And so, again, that's one technique. One te technique I used to use in a classroom with boys, with my boys, is called your two cents. What's your two cents? You get two pennies, and once you've used both your pennies, you have to listen. So again, this, this is a table. I heard some people actually talking a little bit more than others at this table. You're just trying to encourage folks to value their, their opinion. And so again, when they use their two pennies, they're done. Now, in my class, they got so good at this dialogue stuff that I had to start giving them three pennies and four pennies because the dialogue was really good. I've also even used poker chips just to make things a little different. Um, another um, technique that I like, and when you go to the, the, next, the session that I'm doing, I have handouts, and so I have our facilitator toolkit link. You can get to all the stuff that I'm talking about from that toolkit. Another popular technique that I like is called force voting. So I'll give you a quick example of what um, statements I used to use um, at Little Rock Central High School National Historic Site. So one of my statements was, do you use racial slurs? Do you bully? Have you ever been overlooked for something? And basically this part, I used to hear the N-word all the time and I got tired of it. I can't confront that student because that's their truth, but I can have a dialogue about it. And so you have to find a way to get what, what you're wanting, but in a creative way. Um, I was surprised how many times I heard people say, I bully. Like, in, so in the forced voting, you put these statements that go around, they vote anonymous, anonymously. I hit something on here. And you have a discussion about the responses not what people say it individually, because of course it's anonymous. So again, if it's something like one to 20, I'm not gonna go there, because that's calling one person out. But if I have something like seven to 17, or 10 to 15, I'm gonna say, hey, this is very interesting. We're, we're, um, we don't agree on this topic. Um, when Ebola came out, we did, we did one on immigration, and we talked about like, you know, would you be willing to let people come in the country. I don't care remember the, the statements, but they are very, very controversial. It should be something that's really hard to wrestle with, so people can, like, ah, I don't know which way I want to vote. But then you have a discussion about the responses. So all kinds of techniques. And, e and real easy techniques are like small group, pair share, large group discussion. Those are also techniques. Open-ended questions. So I have here ask questions. Oh, you can't just ask any questions with open-ended questions. I see people that ask content related, like, what's the importance of Vicksburg? That's not an open-ended question. There is no right or wrong answer in the question that you ask. Describe a time when you've been discriminated against. Describe a time when you witnessed someone being discriminated against. Um, describe the future of the forming story. But it has to be a question that any person can answer without knowing the content of your, your park. You're going to give them that in the shared experience. You're going to do that in your interpretive talk, your exhibits. You're going to give them those things. So this dialogue needs to be about the individuals in the room. So here's a, uh, two quick examples. So I did this program. I was asked to go and do a program. It was like um, Arkansas Heritage Days. They asked the park to come in to speak at the old state house. And so I was going to have people on lunch break come in to listen to this session. And so my, uh, my 
theme was the power of one. And so uh, we started out, what is your name? And name someone that is special to you. So I just wanted their name. I'm Kimball, my grandmother Lucille. And I asked them to put that in their back pocket. We'll talk about it later. Then I asked, what does community mean to you? So I get to hear people talk about the community. And then I asked, thinking of the person you mentioned earlier, how is that person special? This is large group discussion. And then I did my shared experiences. You know, it was short dialogue. So I took just a minute or two and talked about Daisy Bates, who was the mentor of the Little Rock Nine. I just talked about a little story, something that happened in the courtroom that basically, um, I think, uh, highlighted how she impacted her community, in this case, the black community, and what she did with um, the Central High Crisis. Example number two, I go to a conference every year in um, Ocean City, Maryland. And they did something new this year with uh, round table discussions. And so I had two round tables. So kind of just like this. Teachers come in, they can pick the table that they want to go to. And so I thought this would be a great opportunity to, to find out what the teachers want from the park service. How can we better engage 21st century audiences? And so again, you can see my large group, hey, what do you do? So I can see what the mix of teachers in the, at the table. And then why are you here? Why did you pick my table over the other tables in the, in the round table? And this shared experience of the video clip, it was a clip with President Obama just announcing every kid in the park. And the phase two, what is the most powerful experience you've had in a park? And then what can, what can national parks do? So we're gonna do an activity that I'm just gonna explain because we don't have time, I do apologize. So this is um, blending a couple of techniques here. I put statements or it can be quotes. So I just like Google farming, agriculture. And I came up with three different um, statements. I'll let you read that. You have these statements on your table, just so you know. All right, statement number three, I know it's kind of wordy. And this is talking about modern agriculture. So ideally, if this is a, a utopia, I would have these statements around the room and I would let you, you read all three and you would go to the statement that you wanted to talk more about, you had questions about the statement that resonated with you. I would group you together and you would have a conversation. Now ideally, I mean, this is a, you know, this is a presentation, but if I was doing a facilitated dialogue program, when you do small group, any kind of small group work, you always bring it back to the large group. And so again, these small groups have these powerful conversations. I was hearing some good conversation around the room. And then you want to let people, a few people share what they talked about in their group. So in conclusion, interpretation with visitors is more interesting. It's fun to listen to people. I mean, this, you know, when I hear people say like the craziest things, you know, um, it's just like, wow. And as a facilitator, I have to like keep a straight face. I'm like, hmm. And hope the group is like, you're an idiot. <laughs> and it happens all the time. Or they'll just say, hey, these are guidelines. Like, we need to do this. Like, use our statements. You can't say they, those people. You have to speak from the personal. It can be transformative. You don't know how many times a person has come to me at the end, or a group has had another discussion in the parking lot, or another discussion in the room after the dialogue. Um, I've seen people come to a nine o'clock dialogue and stay the whole day in a park, in a small park it's in Little Rock. It's, it's huge, like it's really small, and to see someone stay the whole day is huge. You can learn about your visitors, and this kind of goes to the tools for evaluation and assessment. So I do a really cool technique called carpet of ideas, or it can be the wall of ideas, and I ask people to give me a re reaction or response at the end, like what can we do? And they give you what we can do. You post it on the wall or on the carpet, and you can take a picture of that. And you can evaluate, or depending on the question, assess where your visitors are. You can do even before or after. Um, another technique is the graffiti wall. You can just say, have a, um, you know, some theme, and have students or your groups come in and write on that wall. And again, you can ask that same question at the end of the program. Does anybody in here do residential programs? Do you bring pe young people in overnight? It's authentic. Again, it's the real. It's their experience. You can't take back a person's experience. 
I did a Black History, um, a series of dialogues in Vicksburg since I've been in the park. First time ever going to a local black church, we went to two, did three dialogues. And at one of the churches, the shared experience was an elderly person from the community who talked about their experience in Vicksburg. That was the real, that was the authentic. And it's our job to provoke. So a lot of times, um, it's funny because I do a brown bag discussion every month in Harper's Ferry. And actually since I've been gone, I've had a couple people say, you're not here, I can't do my brown bag. But they know when they come to my session, I'm gonna provoke them. It's not easy, it's not comfortable. I'm gonna push you because that's where true learning happens. When I was um, in my doctoral program that I did not finish, we were taught to that the, the, the best learning happens at the edge of chaos. The best experiences as a teacher happen at the edge of chaos. So I'm not gonna push you over. <laughs> You'll be okay. Um, but I expect you to be courageous. So I'm gonna end with this. I mean, that's a little writing, right? But basically, Julia Washburn, who's our Associate Director in the Park Service for Education, Interpretation, Education, and Volunteerism, says it's our job to take our young people, our millennials, our new visitors to places that they don't expect to go. It's our job. And that they want to be learned in, in many different ways. Again, I, what I want to end with is that facilitate dialogue is not the only thing you do in your place, but I think it can, be, it can offer an opportunity that enhances your program. So again, at Little Rock Central High School National Historic Site, I would, you know, if, if school groups came to me, they had to be in the park two to four hours. And so if they are there for four hours, or even really two hours, they're gonna get a dialogue. So yeah, they go into the, the this high school was a, the largest high school in the United States when it was completed. They get to go in that building that's five floors, where there's 2,500 students. I Many students who come to the park, like that school, that population at school is the largest in their community, in some of their communities. There's more people in that school than in their towns. And they get, so they get the tour, they get the exhibit, they get um, to go in the gift shop, all kinds of things they can do in the park, but they also get to engage civically and to talk about hard things like race and so forth. All right, thank you. Thank you, Kim.